in Euclidean space. So the way that I plan it, who knows how it will turn out, but I've planned that I'm going to give two lectures about curves and surfaces in Euclidean space and then talk about geodesics. Uh, I, th I think you'll find it uh, to be very interesting how the four lectures are fitting together. I, uh, um, you'll, see, you'll see a lot of connections. OK, so um, uh, I also I'm going to give you note my, my notes from the lectures, so you should feel free not to take notes if you would uh, understand better just by listening. Uh, if you have a question, please interrupt me, slow me down. Um, otherwise, I'll get started. So um, we're talking about functions of several variables here. Maybe this is a better board. So if you have a map f from Rn to Rm, then there are three ways of getting a picture of this function. So the first way is the graph. The graph of f is the set of all points of the form x, comma y in uh, Rn cross Rm such that y is equal to f of x. Okay, So that's the graph. That's maybe one that you're more familiar with. So for example, uh, if we have the function f from r2 to r1, f of xy is equal to uh, x squared plus y squared, then what's the graph of that? Where's the graph of that? Where's the graph of that? In R3, right? The graph of that is in R3. And the graph of f is the set of all points uh, x, y, z, such that z is equal to x squared plus y squared. Uh, uh, for reasons that I'm not going to try to explain, it works out better if we make the vectors vertical. Uh, so what does this look like? Yeah, yeah. So this is a, it's a quadric surface, right? Does everybody know what the symmetry of this is? This is z equals r squared, right? And what is r? r is the, in 3D, r is the distance to the z-axis, right? Rho is the distance to the origin. r is the distance to the z-axis. And so because this is written down with a z and r and no theta, we know that it has what kind of symmetry? Rotation, right? Then we can sketch the whole thing by sketching in the RZ half plane. The, the uh, parabola z equals r squared, and then rotating it. Right. Why? Why is it only a half plane? Right. But we don't. I don't allow r to be negative. Some people allow r to be negative, but I don't allow r to be negative. Okay. So that's the graph. Uh, the second way, second way to get a picture of a function is uh, the image. So f parametrically defines defines its image. So this is what parametrically means. So uh, so for example, if we take the function f from uh, R1 to R3. So f of t is equal to cos t sine t t. This is a map from R1 to R3. The graph of that would be in R4, right? But the image is in R3. And what does the image look like? Helix, yeah, it looks like a helix. Right, the, the x and the y are going around in a circle. Meanwhile, the thing is rising up, right? So it becomes a, it becomes a helix. Uh, so notice that uh, the helix looks like an, a copy of the domain R1 inside R3, right? So the image 
looks like a copy of the domain R1 in the range R3. The graph is actually a special case of this. The graph is a special case of, of, of this image business. Uh, the third way, what's the third way? Who knows? The third way of getting a picture of a function. These are ways of getting a picture of a function. That's only really a good way of saying that F is injected, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, yes. yes. Not Absolutely, yes, yeah. So this is, yeah, definitely. Well, it doesn't have to be injective, but it's better when this dimension is bigger than that dimension. Right, right yeah. Right, so, right. So this is better when this is dimension is bigger than that, yeah. Okay, so the third way uh, is by pre-images. So F implicitly defines the pre-images F inverse of C, where C is in the range, right? So it's a map from Rn to Rm, so C would be in Rm. They're also called level sets. Level sets. Level sets. So let's have an example of this. So, for example, um, <coughs> here's a map F from R2 to R1. So, this one actually makes better sense when this space is bigger than this, right? The image makes sense when this is bigger than this, and the pre image makes sense when this is bigger than this. So, uh, let's say F of uh, let, let me make it a map from F R3 to R2. So uh, F of x, y, z is equal to x squared plus y squared. Okay, that's a function of three variables, you can see, but uh, although one variable doesn't appear. So uh, what are the level sets of that? So F inverse of C is what? What are the possibilities? It's a cylinder, right? It's a cylinder if uh, it's a cylinder of radius what? The square root of C, I guess, right? Yes? Square root of C. If C is positive. Everybody clear on what this is? Why this is a cylinder? This is R squared, right? R squared is the distance from the Z axis. So saying that the distance from the Z axis is, is C is saying that it's uh, c st square root of c, right? Is saying uh, taking all the points that are the same distance from the z axis. So it's a cylinder of radius root c. If c is bigger than zero, what if c equals zero? What is it then? Just the z axis, right? So the z axis. If c equals zero and if z c is negative, it's empty set, right? Okay, so these are three ways of of uh, getting pictures of, of a function f. Again, uh, this one makes best sense when uh, this dimension is bigger than this. This one makes the best sense when this dimension is bigger than this. And the graph is really just a special case of this. Okay, so um, all right. So I, I, I did. I don't know if anybody looked out looked at the. Uh, um, Linear algebra review, but uh, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about linear maps. So these are examples. So a linear map L from R n to R m. I'm going to think of the, is is a map of the form uh, L of x one through x n is equal to, we need, now we need a matrix here, right? So it's going to be uh, A11, A1M here, right? N, right? A, it's going to have M1, AMN, right? So this is, this direction is the domain, this direction is the range, right? So they're N of these and M of those. And we're going to multiply that by the vector X1, xn. Uh, so for example, example, 
quickly. If I take L of xy is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oh, I did that backwards, didn't I? Here I'm going to put xy. So I need uh, 1, 2, 3, is that right? 4, 5, 6. Yes, is that I do it right? So it's going to be uh, x plus 4y, 2x plus 5y, 3x plus 6y. That's a map from R2 to R3. Right? So the, again, this is the domain. This is the range. So that's a, that's a linear map. Uh, I'm going to completely confuse, confuse the distinction between a linear map and the matrix that represents it. So uh, it's a boarding. Um, OK, I see that was wrong in my notes. So what's an affine map? An affine map. is something you get by taking a linear map and adding a constant to it. So it's a, something in the form A. So it's a map from Rn to Rm. And it's a linear map plus a constant. So A of x1 through xn is equal to L of x1 through xn plus a constant term. So let's say y, uh, what, b1 through b. Right, so for example, uh, I could take uh, A of xy is equal to this one here. So 1, 4, 2, 5, 3, 6 times xy plus uh, 7, 8, 9. Right? So that would be x plus 4y plus 7, 2x plus 5y plus 8, 3x plus 6y plus 9. A lot of people would also call this a linear map too, but uh, it's, it's not linear in, in the sense of the definition of linear. So I thought some of you might have been recently taking linear algebra. So I'll, I've stated it like this. OK, so, uh, so that's what a, these are examples, right? These are examples of maps from Rn to Rm. And uh, so what we're going to talk about now is the derivative. And the derivative of a map from Rn to Rm is a, is a linear map or an affine map. So uh, well, there, there's both. So, so let f be mapped from Rn to Rm. And the derivative, the derivative of f at some point, uh, let's call it uh, x0 is the map uh, f prime of x0. It's going to be a matrix. It's going to be the following matrix. Uh, partial x1. Well, hang, hang on a second. Here's how, we're, here's how we remember it, right? So, so f of x is going to be y. And in this case, y is going to be y1 through ym, right? So this is, this is the. This is the, the value of the function. So we take this column vector and we differentiate it um, differenti use it by uh, each of the uh, domain variables. So we, we take this vector and we take partial y1 with respect to x1, partial ym with respect to x1. So here we're taking the partial with respect to x1 on the first column, partial with respect to x2 in the second column. Uh, so what comes all the way over here is partial of y1 with respect to xn, partial ym with respect to xn. OK, so m, so this is n, right? This is the domain. This is the range. This is m. So that's, uh, what is that, m by n matrix? The rows come first. And, uh, and the importance of this is it gives us uh, a linear and affine approximation for the function. I guess I should have said I want to evaluate this at a point, right? So we have all these partial derivatives, and we're going to evaluate them at x equals x. OK, so uh, and 
Anybody have a question? All right. So this gives an affine approximation. to f at the point x0 in the domain. And the affine approximation is this. It's a, it's a of x is equal to f of x0 plus f prime of x0 times x minus x0. Does that look familiar? Right? It's got vector signs, but otherwise it's just the formula for the <coughs> linear approximation to a function, right? It's the same thing just with vectors made into it. And this is a, it's the best, the best affine approximation to f uh, at x0 in some sense. And, and in fact, uh, if f has continuous partials, if f has continuous partials, this is the closest you're going to see to a, a proof in this series of lectures, and it's not a proof at all. But <laughs> it's a, a, actually a, a clear statement. If f is continuous partials, then uh, this is the best. This is the only affine approximation. With the property that a of x minus f of x uh, divided by x minus x naught goes to 0. Uh, and the limit as x goes to x naught. Okay, So it's, it is, in some good sense, the best possible one. So, uh, so here's an example. There are a bunch of examples in the problem set. The problem set has lots and lots of problems that I, I don't mean to scare you by giving you so many problems, but there are problems there of different levels. So I thought you could try to uh, uh, find the right level for you in, in the problems that I assigned. So here's a, uh, an exercise. Um, so let f, this is a map from R2 to R3. So f of xy is equal to uh, x plus y, x minus y, 4xy. Okay, so that's a map from R2 to R3. So a is show the image lies on, I'm leaving this out, dot, 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 you fill in the blank, w is equal to u squared minus b squared. Uh, B, find the affine approximation. Uh, find the affine approximation uh, at the point 1, 1. Identify its image. And uh, C. You can think of how to do A while I erase the blackboard here. It's not hard. What's C? So C is uh, estimate f of 1.01.98 using f using A. Okay. So uh, how do we do this? This is a function from R2 to R3. By the way, what is this thing? What? This is another quadric surface, but it's the one that doesn't have any symmetry. Who knows what this is? Anybody know? It's a saddle surface, right? This is, this is the only one that doesn't have any symmetry. It's, this is, uh, if this is u, I can only draw it in one direction. If this is u and this is v, it looks like this, right? It goes up in the u direction and down in the v direction, right? And this is w. 
Okay, so uh, so what we're showing here, this is a map from R2 to R3, and I'm, te I'm saying that it's, it's the image is on the saddle surface. So how do we check that? Just plug it in, right? In uh, this for U, this for V, and this for W, and it should work, right? So here's A. We plug in. Uh, we plug in U equals X plus Y. Uh, v is equal to X minus Y. Does it work or not? <laughs> it seemed to work at home. W is equal to 4XY. Does it satisfy W equals U squared minus V squared? I think it does. OK. All right, so the image of this thing is on, on the saddle surface. Uh, what's the affine approximation? Well, here's f of, let's just write down f of xy is equal to x plus y, x minus y, 4xy. So f prime, again, the way that you do this is you take this column vector, you differentiate it with respect to x, and then you differentiate it with respect to y. When you differentiate with respect to x, you get 1, 1, 4y, right? And when you differentiate this with respect to y, you get 1 minus 1 for x, right? So that's f prime. And then if we evaluate that, f prime at the point, where's the point? We wanted uh, the point 1, 1. f of prime of 1, 1 is uh, 1, 1, 1 minus 1, uh, 4, 4. Don't let me mess up, by the way, <laughs> OK? <laughs> Keep an eye on me. I'll pretend that I, I messed up on purpose so that you could. Make sure you're paying attention. So that's f prime. So, uh, so what's the affine approximation? The affine approximation is a of xy is equal to f of 1, 1 plus f prime of 1, 1 times uh, x minus 1, 1. Well, I guess, I guess that's the right way to write it. OK, so f of 1, 1, what's f of 1, 1 is 2, 1, 4, right? So 2, 1, 4. Oh, did I mess up? All right, <laughs> 2, 0, 4, OK, good. Plus f prime of 1, 1. f prime of 1, 1 is one, that thing up there, right? 1, 1, 1, minus 1, 4, 4 times, uh, this, let's call this x, y, right, x, y. So this is going to be x minus 1, y minus 1. So that's the affine approximation. I could multiply it together and add it, but let me uh, just talk about it for a minute while it's in this form. What is the image of the affine map? What is the image of that map? What does this look like? What is the image of that? What kind of thing is that? It's a It's a plane, right? It's a plane. And what plane is it? It's the plane through the point 2, 0, 4, right? Because when you plug in x equals 1 and y equals 1, you get, you get this. It's the plane through 2, 0, 4. And two vectors that lie in the plane are this vector and this vector, right? Because you can get a point on the plane by taking this plus, these are, this is any two numbers, right? times this. So all, all linear combinations of these two column vectors. Right? So, so it's the plane through 2, 0, 4 con uh, containing or parallel to the vectors uh, 1, 1, 4 and 1, minus 1, 4. OK, so that's the plane. So uh, and what plane do you suppose that is? <laughs> This is a surface, right? And the point, where's the point? Um, the point 2, 0, 4 is a point on the surface, right? 2, 0, 4, let's see, that's, yeah, so 2, 0, 4. It's, it's actually somewhere like this on the surface, right? I heard somebody say tangent. It's a tangent plane, right? This is the tangent plane. How can we check that this is the tangent plane? It's the tangent plane to the surface w equals u squared minus v squared at the point, where's the point, 2, 0, 4. Does everybody remember from calculus, whatever it was, calculus 3, how to find the tangent plane? What do we do? We take the, this is a, um, 
the tangent plane to this surface, right? You would, in Calculus 3, you would have learned how to take a, take a tangent plane to this surface. And how does that work? Anybody remember? You take the, the gradient, right? You have to put all the variables on one side, and then you take the gradient. So uh, how would we do that? So we take, uh, so the tangent plane, we take the gradient of the, well, we have to take, let's put everything on the other side. So w plus v squared minus u squared, gradient of w plus v squared minus u squared. The gradient of that is the vector uh, minus 2u, 2v, 1, right? This is the gradient. By the way, this is the derivative of a function from r3 to r1, right? It's the gradient, right? So this is an example of the, the derivative, right? as a linear map. And uh, how do we check that? Let's see, we're at the point of 2, 0, 4. This is the vector uh, minus 4, 0, 1, right? So this should be a normal vector to the plane. How can I check that that's a normal vector to the plane? Dot it with these two guys, right? right? If you take the dot product of this, did it work or not? <laughs> yeah, it looks good. OK, you take the dot product of this. With this or this, it's zero, and that shows that this is in fact the, this is in fact the tangent plane. All right. Um, all right. So let's see. Oh, I did all that. That's good. Okay. So what do we do now? We now we do the chain rule. Oh yeah, I did one. Oh, whoop, I didn't do the estimate. I forgot to do the estimate. The estimate was um, to get the estimate. Uh, we, if we plug in here, estimate at uh, 1.01, where did I have it? Oh yeah, 1.01.98. If I plug into this, what I get is, I'll t just tell you what I get. Um, I get 1.99. This is the actual value. Um, 0 0.03, 3.96. So it's a, it's around 204, which is which is the point where we started, and the actual value. The actu this, is, this is the affine approximation. The actual value is 1.99.03, 3.9592. So you see that these are exactly correct, right? The first two entries are exactly correct, and this one is not correct. Why is that? Why is that? Yeah, the original function, right? The original function, these two were linear, right? So the affine approximation to a affine map is the affine map, right? So that's why these two came out exact and this one, this one didn't. OK, so uh, chain rule, what does the chain rule say? So suppose we have a map. Let's see, let me, here. so we have, I'm going to have Rn, and I'm going to have a map F to Rm. And then I'm going to have a map G to RP. The uh, chain rule has to do with differentiating what? Compositions, right? Chain rule has to do with differentiating compositions. So this is a composition of functions, right? First we go from Rn to Rm, and then from Rn to Rp. And uh, let's see. So if F and G are continuously differentiable, then so is the composition. This would be, do I want to write G composed with F, or I want to write F composed with G? Yeah, that's right. OK, this is good. So G composed with F, then so is G composed with F. And the derivative, the derivative is given by G composed with F prime at, well, now we need to have some places to be at, right? So, so let, I'm going I'm to write underneath here. X is a point in Rn. Do I want X naught or just? Uh, so I'm going to call this point X. I'm going to call this point Y. 
And uh, the formula is that G composed with F prime at the point X is G prime at X, I guess I don't even need that, times uh, F prime at, at what? F prime would have to be at, I did it backwards, didn't I? G prime of, yeah, yeah, I did that backwards, right. So G, pr G prime would have to be evaluated here, right? So G prime would have to be evaluated f of x, right? Times, sorry? Yeah, it's the same thing, yeah, yeah. It's y, right? Times, no. no. Is this OK? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Times what? Times f prime at x. And here's the big question is now, this is a composition of functions, right? This is the derivative. What's this? What's this? What are these two things? These two things are matrices. What kind of, what is it? Is matrix multiplication. This is matrix multiplication. So you can ask yourself, why is this matrix multiplication? So this is an exercise. Uh, it has to do with the fact that, remember I said I was going to confuse matrices with linear maps? Well, you, what you have to do is convince yourself if you take two linear maps and compose them, that the matrix that you get when you compose them is the, is the matrix product. So that's what, that's what uh, the product of matrices is, is, is the composition of linear maps. Right? So I'll just leave that as an exercise. You can convince yourself that that's true. Um, matrix multiplication on the matrices corresponds to composition on the, on the linear maps. OK, so, uh, so should we do an example of this? All right, so here's an example. So uh, f of xy is equal to um, x squared plus y squared. I guess it's the same exercise I had before. x squared minus y squared. Uh, y, so it's different. y squared. And g of u v w is equal to u plus v plus w u v. I'll just do half of the, half of the exercise. Right, so use the chain rule. Use the chain rule to find. Let's see, so what can we compose? We can compose G composed with F, right? So does this make sense? So F is a map from R2 to R3, right? And from there, this is a map from R3 to R2, right? You could do it, you could reverse the order, right? That would work too. OK, so this, so this composition makes sense. Uh, this thing is a. What's, what are the dimensions of this matrix? This is a 2 by 2, right? The composition goes from R2 to R2. OK, so uh, use the chain rule. So, um, so what do we need? So uh, let's find G composed with F prime. Now I need a point. Let's take the point 1, 2. And uh, check your answer, but I'll let you do that as an exercise. Check your answer. OK, so what the, f the formula says is that g composed with f prime should be uh, g prime times f prime. And uh, what, is, what is, let's write down these things here. So what's f prime? f prime, remember we take this column vector, we differentiate it with respect to x, and then we differentiate it with respect to y. So we get 2x, 2x, 0, right? And over here we get 2y minus 2y, 2y, right? So this is f prime. 
And we want to evaluate f prime where? Let's see, 1, 2 is a point here, right? 1, 2 is a point here. So we want to evaluate f prime here. So we want to evaluate f prime at the point 1, 2 is uh, 2, 2, 0. Don't let me mess up. Uh, 4 minus 4, 4. Did I do that right? Okay, so that's f prime. And then g prime, what's g prime? g prime is uh, the derivative of this, right? So uh, I take this column vector and I differentiate it with respect to u and then v and then w. So it's going to be uh, 1 v, right? Uh, 1 u and uh, 1 0, right? So this is g prime, this is f prime. And now where am I supposed to evaluate this? I'm supposed to evaluate this at f of 1, 2. What's f of 1, 2 is? f of 1, 2 is equal to uh, 5 minus 3, right? 4. Right, so, so, and this is where we have to evaluate g, right? So g prime evaluated at 5 minus 3, 4. Uh, looks like 1, 1, 1. And then we have uh, minus 3, right? 5, 0. Right? OK, so, so what the composition should be f prime, f composed with g prime at the point 1, 2. Should be, we should get by multiplying these two matrices together. In which direction? We could actually multiply them in both directions, right? But it's. It's f prime times g prime, right? Let's see if it comes out the right size. Right? If, we, if we take f prime is 2, 4, 2 minus 4, 0, 4. Did I do it backwards? What is it? Oh, all right. I'm sorry. Right here, right? All right, all right. OK, thank you. G composed with f. Yeah, that's right. OK, that didn't make any sense. All right, thank you. So this is g prime f prime, right? So g, g prime f prime. Uh, so g prime, we have to do it the other way, right? That'll come out the right size. That's better. OK. So I have to multiply 1 minus 3, 1, 5, 1, 0 by 2, 4. This is going to make a smaller matrix. 2 minus 4, 0, 4. Uh, and the answer should be decomposed with f. It should be 4, 4, 4, minus 32. Did I do that right? 4, 4, 10, minus 6 is 4. Looks, looks right. OK, I'm going to leave that to you to check. Do you know what it means to check? What is it? How would we check this? How would we check this comput com computation? We would take g composed with f, right? What is g composed? Oh, did I say that backwards? <laughs> g composed with f, right? So g composed with f, g composed with f of x, y, right? This is going to be a g composed with f is uh, we get that by plugging, right? So this is going to be we add the three guys together, right? So this plus this plus this, right, is two x squared plus y squared, right? And uh, for this one, we multiply the first two guys together, right? So this times this would be x to the fourth minus y to the fourth. OK. And then what are we checking? We were checking, we're taking the derivative of this, right? And it should equal that. Okay, That's not even that hard, right? OK. All right. Um, OK, so now what's the next big theorem from calculus? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, good for you. Inverse function theorem, right? Change of variables. <coughs> so the inverse function theorem says the following. Inverse 
function theorem. So inverse function theorem, anybody want to guess what has to be true about n and m? When is it going to be able to have an inverse? Yeah, the two dimensions have to be the same size, at least if it's smooth, right? Right, so the, the dimensions have to be the same or there's no hope of talking about an inverse. So, so uh, let this be a smooth map. Oh, did I say what smooth means? Be smooth. So smooth is going to mean that uh, all the partial derivatives have infinitely many. Um, all the partial derivatives exist. Partial derivatives of all orders exist. So, uh, so let suppose we have a smooth map, right, of this form, and say that f of x naught equals y naught. So, if the derivative f prime of x naught is invertible, now this is a matrix, right? Invertible also means bijective, right? This is the same as bijective for a matrix. Well, this bijective is a, it's a property of the linear map, right? Invertible is a property of the matrix, right? So if f prime is invertible, so if the, as it, the, this theorem says, as goes the derivative, so goes the function. If the derivative is invertible, then the function is invertible at least near that point, right? So if f prime of x naught is invertible, then uh, then f is invertible. f has an inverse. Let me see, let me say this a good way. So, so then f is bijective in a neighborhood. I didn't tell you what a neighborhood was. A neighborhood. I will in a second. U of x naught. Uh, the restriction of f to u of f to u has a continuous smooth inverse. Uh, f inverse such that some set v goes to u and with derivative. f inverse prime at, well, let's see, where is this going to be evaluated? This is x, right? x is in the domain, and y is in here. So the inverse is going to be evaluated here, right? It's going to say something about f inverse prime at y naught is equal to, OK, now what is this? This is a matrix, right? What matrix is that? The inverse matrix, right? It's the only thing it could possibly be, right? The inverse matrix. The derivative of the inverse is the inverse of the derivative. So, so it's equal to uh, f inverse prime is f prime at x naught inverse. And this is inverse matrix. OK, so I didn't say what, uh, what a neighborhood is. So, um, so here's a little topology. Let me put it over here. It, it's not a whole lot of topology, but. And you probably won't even have to pay attention to it, but I feel as if I have to you know, define a word if I'm going to put it on the blackboard. So uh, a neighborhood. And, A neighborhood of a point x in Rn is a subset, a subset of Rn uh, containing a, an open ball, containing, containing an open ball B sub R of x is the set of all points y such that the distance between x and y 
is less than r. So this is the open ball of radius r with center x. So for every x, it contains such an open ball. And this is called a neighborhood, uh, period. And then uh, an open set, you probably, you probably wouldn't even worry about the definition of this, even if you hadn't heard it before. But an open set in Rn is a set that is a neighborhood of each of its points, neighborhood of each of its points. OK, that's all the topology we need. OK, so that's. Uh, so the, the, the picture that you should have in mind here is just here's the point x0 uh, that, and sitting inside the domain, which is Rn. f of x0 is y0. And the point is, if this derivative, if the derivative here is bijective, so f is, f is like this, Rn. So if, uh, if the derivative at this one point is bijective, then there's a neighborhood, right? So there's a in, in particular, there's a ball around x0. So that uh, the restriction of f to this ball is bijective. Yes? I think the definition of neighborhood uh, might need modification. Like, don't, don't you mean so neighborhood of point x is a set u? Oh, all right. So for every y in u, the, the open, there's an open. All right, all right, okay, all right. Neighborhood of a point x in Rn is a subset of Rn. No, I think actually I do want that. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, that's a th it is a, uh, neighborhoods are allowed to be closed. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. So you want you, you want to allow it to be Yeah, I do. I think oh. that's the standard definition. Is that right? It's well, weird. Yeah. Open neighborhoods. Yeah. Open yeah. I mean, usually I'm thinking of open neighborhoods. But okay. but for yeah, for, yeah. It's not something that you should be worrying about a lot, but yeah, I I understand the question definitely. It, it I I think I just said to somebody Two days ago. This is such a weird definition. <laughs> it's not you. When you say neighborhood, you're really thinking of an open set. But for technical reasons, that's what they call a neighborhood. Yeah. But but it's a, it's a good question. Thank you. Okay. So um, all right. So we do an example. So here's an example. Uh, so f of x y is equal to uh, x squared plus y squared, x squared minus y squared. Uh, so what's the derivative of this? So f prime of xy <coughs> is equal to uh, differentiate with respect to x, 2x, 2x, y minus 2y, right? So that's the derivative. And uh, how do we test to see whether a, a um, Matrix is invertible or not? We take the determinant, right? So maybe I should have put that here. So note, right? This is an n by n matrix, fortunately, right? This condition, right? That this matrix, this is an n by n matrix. We can tell whether it's inver it's invertible if and only if the determinant is non-zero. So uh, f prime is invertible if and only if the determinant of f prime is not equal to 0. Right? So there's an easy way to test. That one number, see, it's the, uh, that one number, that determinant is going to tell you that the function has an inverse in, some whole, in a whole neighborhood. OK, so here's f, f, f prime of x, y. So uh, let's see. Um, what's the determinant of that? Determinant of f prime is equal to um, minus, minus 8xy, right? OK, so and when is that equal to 0? That's equal to 0 when x, f, x and or y is equal to 0. So when uh, x is equal to 0 or when y is equal to 0. But uh, at some point, if x and y are both not equal to 0, y not equal to 0. So if we, if we take a point in the plane that's not on one of the coordinate axes, then the restriction of this function to a little ball will have, will have an inverse. Right. That's a statement. So, so uh, the restriction 
of f to some bowl, open bowl, open bowl, uh, at x, y. It might be small, right? The, the bowl might be small. But uh, some open bowl uh, will have an inverse, a, a continuously differentiable inverse. Right? This, well, this is, of course, continuously diff This is a smooth function. <laughs> We'll have a, a continuous, a smooth inverse. I think in this case that you can actually solve for the inverse function, but there are lots of cases where you can't actually solve for the inverse function. So let's find the affine map. Find the affine map. That best approximates F inverse close to the point where we need F F of the F of one two. What's F of one two? So uh, one two is over here. This is in the domain. It's taking R2 to R2. F, what's F of 1, 2 is uh, 5 minus 3, right? So 1, 2 is over here. 5 minus 3 is, is somewhere down here, right? So we're going to, um, we want to approximate the inverse, right? So we're going to take a, a ball here to a ball here. So what's the formula for the affine approximation? It's, uh, let me just call it A. Maybe I should call this, this is x, y, right? I should call this u and v, right? Maybe I don't need to call it anything. So, so uh, anyway, the affine approximation at the point 5 minus 3 is f inverse, I guess I don't have to call it anything, f inverse of 5 minus 3 plus f inverse prime of 5 minus 3, right? f of 1, 2 is 5 minus 3, so f inverse of 5 minus 3 is 1, 2, right? And how do I find f inverse prime of 5 minus 3? I find f prime at 1, 2, and then I take the inverse matrix. Right? So let's find f prime of 1, 2, and I'll stop. All right. So uh, did I mess up? What's the problem? The yes. Uh, they don't use oh, oh, right, 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 right. U minus five. B minus three. Yes. Thank you. B plus three. Right. Yeah, I did need it. But, yeah. Okay. So what do we have here? So we have. Uh, so it's f prime. Is this the, is this the function here? Yeah. This is still the function, right? So. So f prime at 1, 2 is what? So f prime of 1, 2 is uh, 2, 2, 4 minus 4. Did I get that right? Anybody know how to make take the inverse of a 2 by 2 matrix? <laughs> There's a formula. I, I don't remember it myself, but it's, it's actually written in the uh, the exercises, or it's, I think it's actually in the linear algebra notes. It's, it's. Let's see, where is it? It's A B C D inverse D, and divide by the determinant, right? Minus B divided by the determinant, minus C divided by the determinant, and A divided by the determinant. So this, the inverse of that matrix, if I did it correctly, turns out to be. This matrix, 1 fourth, 1 fourth, 1 eighth, minus 1 eighth, right? 
So that's the inverse matrix. So the affine approximation is uh, uh, oh yeah. I, so this is uh, one two, right? Plus this matrix uh, one fourth one fourth fourth one eighth minus one eighth uh, times u minus five. So this should be affine of uv, right? u minus 5, v plus 3. OK, I'll stop there. Thanks.